I guess for me personally, if I were ranking silver, I'd probably rank it as a four. I suspect my portfolio of those stocks will double and triple. Physical silver for me is almost an orphan. The bellwether stocks probably uh, would be the old American incumbents, Hecla and Coeur d'Alene. I continue to be a fan of Pan American, despite the fact it's been hugely disappointing. Go Gold is a strong tier two. I, I own a bunch of Adriatic. Visla, that's a legitimate discovery, uh, as is Aya, frankly. I, I was a doubter around Hercules. Uh, I'm doing some work right now on Silvercrest, which really disappointed me. The most leveraged silver stock, of course, in terms of investor expectation, is First Majestic. There's nothing in the world I like more than a really truly hated five or $10 million stock. All right, Rick, no time for interest today. I want to milk this complete whole hour as much as possible. So, uh, well, thank you, obviously, for being here. Uh, but silver has disappointed me and a whole lot of people out there. But I I've seen you talk a whole lot about it. And people asked me to get you on for a full hour or more on silver. But why? Why, why do I even care about silver right now? Well, I would argue that the disappointment... Uh, well, let me, let me answer the question before I launch into my tirade. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in silver precisely because it's disappointed people. I'm I'm interested in silver precisely because uh, your audience, uh, who probably had some expectations around the year 2020 around silver, uh, was disappointed. I'm interested in silver because it's unpopular, it's out of favor, and it's regarded as dead in the water. I remember, Antonio, when you and I were discussing uranium uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and some of your constituents were asking whether or not we'd lost our minds. Uh, obviously, buying things when they're hated and enjoying the arbitrage from hated to unhated is the easiest money that's made in speculative markets. And the fact that from a speculative point of view, silver is dead in the water. Uh, and from the point of view that it has disaffected so many people who were attracted to it in 2020 and 2021 is precisely the reason why I'm attracted to it. Now, let's get around to the basics of your question. Why silver? Silver is the most volatile, I would suggest, of the precious metals. I'm defining the precious metals to be gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Uh, silver traditionally is uh, a second half mover, meaning in precious metals bull markets, the markets are generally led by gold. Once the trend is established and the narrative is, is established, silver for whatever reason, and I'm not sure of the reason, perhaps the lower unit cost, moves further and moves faster than gold. My first attraction to silver, of course, came in the decade of the 1970s. Uh, the cause for that attention was the fact that the silver price moved from, if my memory serves me well, $1.20 to $50. Uh, which was certainly a dramatic move. I'm not trying to say that I caught the bottom or that I caught, that I caught the top, but I caught enough of the middle <laughs> that it attracted my attention and has for the rest of my life. Uh, and as dramatic as the moves in silver are, the moves in the silver stocks, possibly because the population of them is so few, is even more extravagant. Uh, during that period, the 1970s, one silver stock Coeur d'Alene Mines moved from $0.10 cents to $65, alas, sadly, without me. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, others did, did fine with it. So I, I would say that there are, from a fundamental point of view, a couple reasons to be interested in silver and silver stocks. But you have to be, uh, I, I would suggest, first of all, a speculator. Uh, and you have to be, I would suggest, a contrarian. The easy money will be made in silver and the silver stocks simply from the arbitrage between hated and disgusted and unhated. 
just as we saw in the uranium stocks. The easy money in the uranium juniors happened as a consequence of them becoming simply less hated. And that will happen with silver too. Mm -hmm. Silver is unique, uh, I think, in ways that your listeners need to understand when they're trying to comprehend silver. First of all, most silver doesn't come out of silver mines. <laughs> so the supply side is a really interesting conundrum of new mine supply. Last year, I believe 18% of the new mine supply of silver came from silver mines. The rest came from copper mines, gold mines, uh, and lead and zinc mines. So trying to forecast mine production based on the silver price is a fool's errand because gold prices and copper prices and lead prices and zinc prices are more important to silver production than silver prices are. And equating mining costs around primary producers is an illusion too, because those costs only pertain to 18% of mined production. Most silver, as a consequence of it being a byproduct or a co-product, uh, requires, from a mining standpoint, only the processing of the silver stream. The costs are paid for by other metals. So the primary cost of production of silver is often less than people think it is. And as the price of silver rises, the supply rises for two reasons that most people don't consider. The first is recycling. Uh, at low silver prices, uh, it is less efficient to recycle. At higher silver prices, it's more efficient to recycle. And the easiest silver to grab is the silver that's already been mined that is recycled as a consequence of uh, industrial utilization. The second is that the above ground stockpiles of silver uh, are large and almost unknowingly, uh, unknowable unknowably large. Uh, silver still represents uh, a store of value, uh, if you will, off official balance sheets, particularly in South Asia, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. A and what you'll find is that when the silver price moves up in, in U.S. dollar terms, uh, particularly when the U.S. dollar moves up relative to South Asian currencies, uh, that uh, South Asian people tend to dishoard their silver, which is to say they tend to be better silver investors than Americans. They tend to buy it low and sell it high, <laughs> unlike us who tend to buy it high and, uh, of course, sell it low. So the supply of silver is very difficult to understand. The demand side can be similarly difficult, although it's important to note that right now at these silver prices, there is a supply deficit, which is to say the amount of silver produced in all sectors, primary production, co-production and recycling is substantially less than global consumption for fabrication. It's important to know that. What is unknowable, at least by me, is what the above ground inventories are <laughs> and where they're available for sale. So mm -hmm. the fact that there is a primary deficit, uh, while it's relevant, is a very difficult thing to gauge fundamentally because most of the supply uh, that's ever been mined still constitutes in some way, shape or form supply. Silver bulls, uh, if there are any left, uh, other perhaps than myself, uh, should get solace from the fact that industrial utilization and application of silver is growing very rapidly. The solar industry, as an example, doesn't exist without the reflective properties of silver. All of the uh, all of the new solar panels that you see in northern Europe, where the sun doesn't shine. Uh, are, of course, dependent on solar, uh, pardon me, on silver. Uh, but importantly, uh, new utilizations of silver uh, are uh, occurring. It is fairly durable. It's fairly malleable. It's fairly conductive. And as a consequence of that, and by the way, it's cheaper than gold, of course. As a consequence of that, the utilization of silver in the fabrication of electronics is growing rapidly. 
But silver is also a superb germicide, uh, which means that medical applications, water treatment applications, and sewerage treatment applications of silver, making use of its germicidal properties, uh, are probably the fastest growing uh, new uh, technological innovations uh, around silver. And, and I think it's important for people to note that. Um, one of the things that I've always laughed about with regards to the gold market is that with regards to gold, we usually take it out of a hole in the ground called a mine. And then we put it in a hole in the ground called a vault. Uh, with regards to silver, uh, an awful lot of it is used. Now, some of it is, of course, as we said before, recycled. Uh, it comes back into supply. But a lot of it doesn't. Uh, a lot of it is just plain used. And I think that's important. The price of silver, however, does not seem to be set by supply-demand imbalances, perhaps because the supply is so difficult to understand and forecast, <laughs> as is the demand. Uh, a, a lot of silver is held off balance sheets, again, partic uh, particularly in South Asia. And it's difficult to know exactly what demand is there because people are using it precisely because it isn't a government currency. Uh, it, it's used as protection from their government. Uh, and those people are wisely unwilling to disclose uh, wealth that they are trying to protect from their own governments. This, I can tell you, uh, when demand for silver, investment demand for silver picks up, the price of the stuff is extraordinarily volatile uh, to the upside. Mm -hmm. um, I have watched now, I guess three times in my life, uh, the silver pl price flirt with 50 U US dollars. The first time from a dollar twenty start. The second time, if my memory serves me well, from a $4 start. The third time, if my memory serves me well, from a $15 start. Uh, in each case, while the gains that were possible in the metal were lovely, the gains that were possible in the stocks for people who paid attention to the stocks, uh, people who actually did real research, and in particular, people that had the courage to buy them when they were out of favor, were extraordinary. Uh, my friend Doug Casey, who, if you haven't interviewed, you should at some point in time, uh, famously said uh, at the New Orleans Investment Conference years ago that the market capitalization of silver equities is insufficient to accommodate the inflows of capital from generalist investors when the precious, precious metals narrative takes hold. His colorful illustration uh, was that when the generalist investors' money began to crowd into the silver equities, the result was like trying to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. Uh, and I've witnessed this. Uh, the aforementioned the Coeur d'Alene was, of course, the most dramatic example from $0.10 cents to $65. But in my own experience in the early 90s when silver was out of favor, I had the good fortune to participate <clears throat> in the construction of two, two silver companies. Silver Standard Mines, now SSR Resources, and Pan American Silver, now Pan American Silver. Uh, the beginning point for both of those occurred with silver below five US dollars an ounce. Uh, silver Standard, if my memory serves me correctly, we financed at 72 cents with a full warrant. Six or so years later, the stock was trading for $45. Pan American, I know this time my memory serves me correct, we financed at 50 cents a share. Uh, and in six or seven years, that stock also crested at $45. This gives you some indication uh, why there is a subset of investors, or pardon me, a subset of speculators who are maniacal about silver, hmm. uh, simply because of its upside volatility. People tend to view that upside volatility in an almost religious fashion. 
which is to say that when silver speculators, for whatever reason, believe that silver should move uh, and it doesn't move, they assume that all is wrong with the world. And this come this brings us to the topic that will derive more hate from your listeners or some of them than anything else I say, which is the topic of manipulation. There is a cottage industry uh, around describing the manipulation in the silver market. And I am the first to acknowledge that the silver market is manipulated in the very short term. The trading desks and coalitions of individuals around the world can manipulate almost any financial market from markets as large as the euro and the euro dollar to the U.S. Treasury market <laughs> to basically all commodity markets. Uh, but silver is especially prone to short-term manipulation because of the extraordinarily leveraged relationship between the silver futures market and the spot silver physical market. It is very common for silver futures markets to trade 200 times the amount of silver available for good delivery per day, mm. <laughs> per day. So if you think about that over the course of the month, 200 times 30, you'll get the sense that often the outstanding value of futures contracts in the silver market on a monthly basis <laughs> are 6,000 times the amount of silver available for good delivery. Hmm. The theoretical technique uh, around moving the silver price higher or lower than through manipulation, or at least one way, would be to establish a position, long or short, in the futures market, uh, a laddered position from three months, even 30 days, out to two years, uh, and then exert influence in the physical market, either long or short, during that period of the trading day when there was the least amount of volume, so that the least amount of money applied could generate the largest move. Let's look at hypothetical math. Uh, an intelligent group of traders, uh, I, notice I didn't say a moral group of traders, but rather an intelligent group of traders, uh, borrows, let's say, $50 million worth of physical silver, just for a round number, while simultaneously uh, on the short side, because that's been the easiest thing to do for the last few years, uh, shorting a billion dollars worth of silver futures, applying the type of margin that's available in that business, which is to say 10 to 1 margin. So we now have a billion dollar short ladder, uh, which stands us $100 million or $150 million if we're cautious. We've borrowed, remember, $50 million worth of physical silver. And we sell that $50 million worth of civil, uh, silver on the, spart, on the spot market day market during a point in time when the market is very, very, very liquid. It is possible through this technique to knock the silver price down 4%, 5%, or 6%. And that 4 or 5% move is reflected in the futures market, where we have a billion dollar position with $150 million worth of exposure. So in a sense, uh, we have affected a, a really spectacular leveraged gain uh, relative to the amount of money uh, that we have lost by borrowing and selling that physical silver into the uh, into the physical market uh, and then rebuying it and delivering it back to the borrower. You will note that it was precisely this technique which was used to manipulate the market the silver market in the 70s, long. <laughs> the manipulators don't care up or down. They will manipulate a market using the leverage inherent in the futures market, whichever way is easiest for them to manipulate it. Given the strength of the US dollar that we've seen for the last 40 years, 
and the concomitant relative weakness in precious metals prices, for most of the last 40 years, the easiest way to manipulate the price of silver in the short term was down, not up. There will be periods of time, I suspect, in the next 10 or 15 years, when it will be much easier to manipulate the price of silver up. <laughs> and I think that that will occur with the same degree of frequency <laughs> that you're seeing now on the short side of the market. I am not one of those who believes in the long-term systemic manipulation of the silver price simply because nobody has had, to do, has had the need to do so. The strength of the U.S. dollar has done a wonderful job <laughs> reducing uh, demand for silver and reducing demand for silver stocks. I don't believe either that the people who are alleged to preside over this manipulation, whoever they might be, the Rothschilds, the Bildenbergers, the Fed, JP Morgan Chase, whoever they are, President Biden, uh, I don't think collectively that they have the intelligence uh, or, or the patience or the need to engage in a long-term rig. Uh, I cut my teeth in the Vancouver Stock Exchange as a young man, and I saw an awful lot of manipulated markets and rigs. And I don't believe that I ever saw one that lasted more than six weeks, simply because the conspirators would turn on each other <laughs> when there was too much profit built into the transaction. And I suspect at the upper levels of Wall Street, that the circumstance is the same as it was on the lowest levels of Howe Street in Vancouver. And so for that reason, while I acknowledge and expect the silver market to be manipulated in the short term, I don't see any evidence or frankly any reason for silver to be manipulated on the long term. Mm -hmm. I do see uh, a situation where what we've observed in the last 50 years or, or 40 years the benefits to the economy of demographics, which is to say the baby boomers contributing rather than extracting from the economy. Uh, global peace, uh, which seems sadly to be in retreat. Global free trade, which seems sadly to be in retreat. But importantly, uh, ever lower interest rates, which are very much in retreat. Uh, I see a circumstance now where the wind is shifting uh, from silver facing a headwind to silver and gold having the wind in their sails. Be very clear, or I should be very clear with your listeners. I don't own gold as an example, because I think it might move in US dollar terms from $1,925 to $2,100. This $2,000 level means nothing to me nor do moves that last a week or two weeks. I own gold because I'm afraid that the set of circumstances that we face today will cause gold to go to $6,000 or $7,000. In fact, when younger members of your audience say to me, Rick, how can you cling to this relic gold? When is it going to move? Well, I began buying uh, bullion or rebuying bullion for my own account in 1998, admittedly a little early. But in the period 2000 to 2023, the gold prices moved from 256 US dollars to almost $2,000. So when people say, when is it going to move? Over the last 23 years, <laughs> that's when it's going to move. It has moved. But I suspect, I don't know, I suspect that the move in front of us uh, will be much greater. And my experience has been uh, over 49 years that the markets, when I say markets, I mean precious metals markets are led by silver, by, by gold, pardon me. But when that momentum and when the narrative is established, as we said before, silver moves further and it moves faster and the silver stocks move the farthest of all. From my own perspective, I'm likely to have a, a fairly de minimis part of what is a fairly large net worth involved in speculating in silver and silver stocks. I suspect uh, something like two and a half percent of my portfolio uh, will be, by the end of uh, 2023, involved in the silver trade. One of two things could happen. Uh, 
I could bore myself to tears, which I'm okay with. Uh, boredom, I think, is high praise. Or I could be wrong, uh, and I could lose maybe 50% of 2.5% of my net worth. Or I could be right, and I could enjoy a triple in the middle, or, uh, and, pardon me, a 10-bagger or so in the stocks. Make no mistake, if past this prologue, and the gold price were to triple, the silver price, if history is our guide, would do better than triple. <laughs> and uh, the silver stocks would, uh, in certain cases at least, the better ones, give you the type of performance that the better ones, the better speculative ones, have given me in the past. And those are very handsome returns indeed. It wouldn't surprise me to see a 2.5% allocation of my portfolio become 20% of my net worth, uh, juxtaposed to, if I'm wrong, seeing 2.5% of my portfolio uh, become 1% or 1.5% of my portfolio. The juxtaposition of the upside to the downside uh, is so spectacular that I can't help myself. Do I know when it's going to occur? Of course not. I don't even know if it's going to occur. What I do know is that the competition to put those positions on from other speculators is non-existent. <laughs> uh, and I love circumstances where an asset class that I would like to own is one where I enjoy no competition on the bid, uh, which I hope describes to you the silver case from a historic point of view. This is, I'm a lucky, lucky man because you're making my job easier. I've heard interviews of yours that have been shorter than this answer. So thank you. I'm incredibly lucky to have this. Um, interesting, because I wanted to ask you about the risk reward on it. And you, you again, you made my job easier. But you say maybe 50% down, but then 10x to the upside. You, you're a banker. So you think in numbers, where are those numbers on the risk reward coming from? Um. I, I find it difficult to see very much recycling at all or very much new mine production taking place at a 50% lower silver price. If you saw the silver price at $10 or $12, uh, I think you would shut in most primary producing silver mines in the world. And I think that you would eliminate probably half of the recycling that takes place which means that the existing supply deficit, which has been reported by the Silver Institute of about a billion ounces uh, of silver a year, uh, probably would double, uh, which is to say on the supply side of the metal, the problem would take care of itself with a lower silver price. Not by enough to save me, losing half is never fun, but I don't see uh, the probability of a circumstance of losing more than half. Uh, it is possible that I could lose more than half on the silver stocks because a 50% downside in the price of silver would shut them in. <laughs> it would truly shut them in. Uh, that isn't what I think is going to happen because I think that the whole precious metals sector uh, has a future that's almost guaranteed by excessive government uh, excessive government debt and excessive spending, uh, something which sadly I expect is going to continue for the rest of my life. For your audience's benefit, I'm 70 uh, and I expect to live a long time. Uh, so I really do think that the tailwinds are in place, but I have to acknowledge the fact that I've been wrong uh, occasionally before with regards to commodity price uh, projections. Other people have too. So I'm completely sanguine uh, with a speculative position uh, that could, from my point of view, either lose half or go up tenfold. The tenfold case really revolves around history. Uh, it, it involves psychology. You will remember, Antonio, you and I began uh, discussions of silver during the sort of Reddit craze when groups of internet-based uh, young speculators uh, 
developed a narrative around silver that was entirely new to me, what I'd never thought of, uh, which is to say that the float of available silver relative to the means of millions of people banded together in a network was insufficient. <laughs> and that by driving a constrained float in the same way that they drove G GameStop and AMC uh, and other things, that they could undo the leveraged short position that existed in the futures market. And by the way, I think they came pretty close. Uh, in the end, there wasn't enough follow through. Uh, it really had never occurred to me that uh, a, a network uh, engaged in manipulating a tight float was a fundamental. <laughs> it isn't ever the way I thought of investing before. It was a fascinating period for me uh, observing it. The aftermath of that is that a lot of the people who, as a consequence of the narrative of a managed float and a network, adopted the rest of the silver narrative. Uh, in other words, uh, speculators, particularly young speculators, looking for facts to justify their actions, uh, adopted a whole bunch of the silver narrative uh, and became much like silver bugs of my own generation, almost religious adherents to the silver narrative. Uh, when those people were disappointed, and I'm using generalizations, when many of those people were disappointed, they became jilted lovers. <laughs> Rather than blaming themselves, of course, they blamed silver. Uh, and the consequence of that, as I say, is a wonderful circumstance now where uh, silver is hated. Uh, I, I would joke that may many native English speakers uh, who are silver bugs Think of silver as a four-letter word, <laughs> despite the fact that that misspells it. Uh, and I really like that. Uh, I, I really like the fact that the sort of traditional upside around silver uh, is available to me for almost no speculative premium. Hmm. It's, it, it was really to justify the gamble more than it was to justify the speculation. Uh, I think that puts it better and um no you're right uh th th there's there's a new term for that it, we, we call ourselves bag holders and we some of us are very proud of that knowing all that based on the risk reward that you that you gave me here would you rank silver the highest in terms of risk reward among the precious metals uh if we count platinum and palladium as precious metals uh i i would uh probably place platinum uh right now a little ahead of silver mm. that is to say a little better the, the reason for that is that russia is dishoarding everything they can they're selling diamonds which is why the diamond prices collapsed <laughs> they're selling enriched uranium and highly enriched uranium they're selling nickel <laughs> they're selling platinum they're selling palladium they're selling rhodium <laughs> it, you might have noticed in europe but the russians have some bills to pay uh, and they are a little less able to sell oil and gas to you. The consequence of that is that the play, that the platinum price in particular has been, uh, I, I would suggest, smashed by Russian dishoarding. Uh, I'm not saying that the hostilities in the Ukraine will end anytime soon. I'm not smart enough to understand what might cause that to occur. But I do remember the last period of Russian dishoarding uh, 1989, 1990, 1991. Uh, what happened then was that Russia's cupboards went bare. <laughs> they sold what they had to sell while at the same time deferring sustaining capital uh, uh, in their oil and gas and mining industries. And the Russian selling pressure abated because Russian inventories abated too. And I suspect that despite the richness of uh, Norilsk, that at some point in time, the Russians' ability to continue to sell platinum, palladium, nickel, copper, cobalt, rhodium uh, ends, uh, and that those markets will rebound. So in direct answer to your question, I think platinum is even more hated than silver. Uh, and I think the risk of uh, supply side declines in platinum are greater, given that platinum is really only produced in South Africa, which is a basket case. 
Zimbabwe, which is worse of a basket case, <laughs> and the Russians, who right now can't afford to make sustaining capital investments and are selling whatever they can. If you had any challenge in the platinum market, I know this is a silver interview, but since you asked me, I'll answer. If you had any challenge in on the supply side of the platinum market for any of those three societies, and I think the possibility of that is large, uh, you'd see a soaring platinum price. So I'm a, a speculator in platinum more than palladium uh, because platinum is cheaper than palladium and, and fabrication technologies to utilize platinum where palladium uh, enjoys the advantage now are advancing rapidly precisely because I think that there's a possibility rather than a probability of political or social disruption of platinum and palladium production in any of South Africa, Zimbabwe, or Russia. That doesn't distract from the silver thesis, by the way. I'm attracted to it. But in direct answer to your question, uh, I, I think the, the lineup for platinum is even better than the lineup for silver. What's missing with platinum in favor of silver is the manic depressive nature of the speculator. Uh, that, that isn't to say that platinum hasn't delivered some quantum gains in the past, but silver has this reputation, uh, perhaps because of its low unit cost. I really don't know why, but when a silver bull market gets underway, uh, it's something to behold. Uh, not unlike uh, uranium bull markets, there is a memory uh, that investors have, uh, at least investors my age. Uh, of a market that went from a dollar twenty to fifty dollars, or four dollars to fifty dollars, there's a, a an institutional memory and an individual memory, and in fact, an expectation that when the momentum gets established by silver, uh, people just flock into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know I, why, to be honest with you, Antonio. I just know that. <laughs> There's uh the, there must be a reason you know maybe something something with the poor man's gold or something in those lines that that goes back in history too, but it I know you do your rankings on companies and not on specific metals, but would it be just like could you say that like what would silver rank for you right now is it is it a four is it a three? I've never thought of it in that regard, so I'm going to have to defer the question. Uh, I think, too, that the rankings, your listening audience needs to understand that those rankings uh, reflect my own needs and biases. Mm. Um, I look at the sort of raw juxtaposition of risk to reward. Uh, a younger audience might be either more cautious or more speculative than me, and they need to take my rankings in terms of their own portfolio consideration. I guess for me personally, if I were ranking silver, I'd probably rank it as a four. And I'd probably rank platinum as a three, because I think that the probability of platinum disruption is greater than the probability of silver disruption. And I think too, that the pricing pressure at the top of the platinum market is more temporary. I think it's more related to Russian fiscal needs than anything else. So if I had to rank them both, I suspect, because I haven't thought about it, to be honest with you, I've I've now thought about it for what, minute, minute and 20 seconds or something. Uh, uh, I would probably assign silver a four ranking for historical purposes and platinum a three ranking. Mm. You can, if you, because you, you're sort of uncertain because you only thought about it for a minute, that never stopped um Paul Krugman for coming up with opinions on inflation. So, um, well, you know, my, my, my track record has some holes in it, but it's way better than Krugman's. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And explaining people that your rankings don't necessarily apply to their portfolio, their situation is just a lost battle. Actually, people still ask me about my opinion on stocks, and I've literally never made any money in, in mining stocks. I had paper gains for a while, but then I lost, I gave, gave all of it back as I wrote it up and down. And that also might be actually a topic to to talk about here, but it's potentially also just too early to talk about a an exiting strategy or how to even deal with exiting because it's it doesn't seem like it's it's started yet. But you you told me, I believe in 2020, you told me that you should think about exiting before even entering. And so how would you how would you how would you deal with an exiting strategy on silver? Um in a very broad sense, 
when it became popular. Uh, I have now exited, uh, I owned 11 or 12 junior uranium stocks, little ones. Uh, and I exited enough of those positions when they ceased to be hated that I had the rest of my position for free. You'll remember I did the same thing in 2021. Uh, we were talking about the uranium business. Uranium took off. I thought the market got overheated. I sold some. I don't believe the uranium market's overheated now, but I do believe that uh, it's in my interest in a market uh, where when part of my thesis has been fulfilled, that I take some gains. Part of the reason why I'm buying silver and silver stocks is simply because it's hated. Uh, and when it ceases to be hated, uh, I will probably take enough gain that I have the rest of my positions for free. Uh, if I remember back to the early part of the decade of the 70s, I bought a lot of Pan American at 50 cents and I bought a lot of silver standard at 72 cents. And in both cases, I had warrants. I did not hold all my stock to $50. <laughs> In both cases, I was a $2.50 seller. Mm -hmm. Do I wish I had that stock back at $45? Of course. Does it matter what I wish? No, of course not. Uh, what I was able to do was sell enough stock that I had the rest of my stock for free and I could become very, very, very patient with it. And I suspect that that's what will happen to me in terms of the silver juniors. I suspect that... Uh, my portfolio of, of those stocks will double and triple uh, in the first wave of a bull market. And I hope that I'm sanguine enough to sell enough of the positions that the rest of my stock is free, at least with regards to my, my juniors, my penny dreadfuls. Uh, and after I've accomplished that, I, I call that the point of no concern. Uh, I use that slogan to differentiate it from the point of no return, which is where you've absolutely lost money on positions. Uh, I hope that I will be intelligent enough to recognize not the top of a silver bull market, but rather a, a market structure that allows me to de-risk my portfolio totally so that I can be a much more patient speculator for the rest of the bull market. What's the, the count? The, the rest of the bull market will really be uh, a function of, I think, when you start to see a large scale financing of marginal silver deposits. Uh, when you start seeing the banks finance deposits that take 40 or $50 silver to make it work, uh, my suspicion is that you will see silver on the cover of Business Week magazine. You'll see silver covered by barons. Uh, you'll see your own audience not wanting to talk about anything other than silver. And when silver begins to um, enjoy that type of mind share, you'll know it's over. It, I I just saw I believe yesterday or today or the day before that whatever uh, Cameco was being discussed on on CNBC and it kind of got me worried a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to ask you what what is the Cameco of silver that's now not being discussed but might suggest me that it's time to exit silver once it starts getting discussed. Well, you know that's an interesting thing about silver. There is no brand name silver stock that enjoys the apparent hegemony. Uh, that Cameco does. Uh, I continue to be a fan of Pan American, despite the fact it's been hugely disappointing for some reasons not entirely related to the silver market. <laughs> the bellwether stocks probably uh, would be the old American incumbents, Hecla and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, I don't own either of them, by the way, uh, but they would probably be the bellwether stocks. There is no Cameco equivalent. You could look at uh, Hothschilds uh, trading in London. You could uh, look at, I guess the closest thing would be Fresnillo, the great Mexican producer. Uh, I, I think you'll need to come down 
in quality a little bit um, to the silver crests, the mags, uh, the companies like that. I suspect if we saw a silver bull market in the order of magnitude that I'm talking about, uh, I think that even companies like Silvercrest or Mag with reasonably stout uh, market capitalizations relative to the rest of the junior space would surprise people to the upside. The most leveraged silver stock, of course, in terms of investor expectation is First Majestic. But I think in, I think speculators need to look at First Majestic uh, before they consider the leverage to silver as a company whose intermediate term leverage is much more involved in the turnaround of Jarrett Canyon. Uh, there are issues around First Majestic and opportunities. When I say issues, <laughs> you know, they have had a habit of buying very large underperforming mines that have been milked uh, and uh, spending the time and treasure necessary to turn them around. So I'm not suggesting that they can't turn around Jared Canyon. I'm just suggesting that before somebody looks at uh, First Majestic as a silver stock, they need to first consider it as a Jared Canyon stock. It's a good point. I, I, have, I have some Keith. I have some faith that Keith Newmeyer will be able to do that, given that I've doubted him three times before, and he's proved me wrong three times before. <laughs> I look forward to being proved wrong a fourth time. But we also, you know, reminding me though, we we spoke must have been right after Keith got the Jerry Canyon. And you told me that you didn't have the highest conviction that he would be able to make the mine work um, in that in the way that he and the market had hoped because the market gave him value for that. And it turns out that you were right on that mine. And I suppose that's not, that's not the point. The point for me, it's sort of actually a question is, like, first of all, how, how did you know? And is there a way for me to know when I see the next Jared Canyon, albeit with whatever other company it could be so that I can sort of protect myself or or have some sort of an edge? Well, you'll note that I was concerned about Sandemus too. Mm. Uh, and he made it work. Uh, I go back with Jared Canyon all the way back to Freeport Gold, which is to say in the 1980s. So I know that deposit very well. Uh, I've probably been on it five times. Uh, later in its life, uh, it was owned by a former business partner of mine, Eric Sprott. Uh, and I watched Eric try to operate that mine privately. Uh, and Eric is a very, very smart guy. Uh, by the way, a very, very rich guy. <laughs> uh, so I, I looked at a deposit or a series of deposits uh, around Jarrett Canyon that had been operating for 35 years. <clears throat> I looked at a deposit that had been starved for cash where uh, a lot of investment was needed. And the investment was needed all the way down to uh, exploration. And it seemed to me it was going to be a challenge, uh, a challenge in particular because um, First Majestic uh, was busy building Armitano as an example uh, and operating other mines. And they didn't necessarily have the ability to shift personnel from one place to another, given that their jobs, you know, that they already had uh, operational, I wouldn't call them issues, but they had uh, operational opportunities elsewhere in their portfolio that might preclude them sending their very best people to Jared Canyon. That turned out to be true. Mm. I don't believe that the final chapter has been written, by the way. I'm not saying that they will turn it around. I'm not saying that they won't turn it around. But if I've learned anything from watching those guys, they're going to give it a real good shot. Mm. And, and if they turn it around, uh, notice I said if, there's a lot of upside in that stock. Where have you ranked it right now, knowing that? That there's Six. a lot of upsides. Six. Okay. There's a lot of risk. I got to see. Uh, and if I get two more bad quarters out of Jared Canyon, that's going to fall to seven. Uh, that's an operational challenge that could pull them through the floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I hope they're going to make it work, but they got to prove to me that they're going to make it work before it gets to five or better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, well, you know this by now, Antonio, my rankings work both ways. 
<laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, again, they, they, they apply to you and your own biases. And again, we can keep yep. saying that people are not going to listen. They just want the rent. They just want you to tell them what to buy so they can go back to watching TV, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> It's um the last time we spoke, we talked about rankings on uranium companies. You told me fission next gen were fours. Is there a silver company that ranks higher or close to them? Uh, I'm doing some work right now on Silvercrest, which really disappointed me. Uh, it disappointed me because the reserve reconciliation was so far from the mark. That being said, uh, the mine is operating now. It's making money. They're generating a lot of cash. They're paying down debt. And the stock has fallen by 50%. <laughs> so <clears throat> Silver Cle Silvercrest may get an upgrade. I've, mm -hmm. I'm have i trying to upgrade Pan American in my own mind. When the Pan American management team uh, issued new stock uh, equal to their entire existent, existing market capitalization, to buy the assets or some of the assets from Yamana, it occurred to me that Pan American management must like the Yamana assets more than they like the Pan American assets <laughs> because they, they they issued enough stock to value the Yamana assets at more than their own. I sold my stock when that happened. Uh, a couple things have happened since. Uh, the first thing is that the share price has fallen again by 30 or 40 percent which means that that combination of assets is cheaper than it used to be yeah. the second thing that's happened is that the pan american management team has done uh, a reasonable job of selling some of the assets from yamana that they consider to be redundant particularly the copper assets which has improved the balance sheet of pan american substantially the most important thing for me, though, uh, in terms of my potential re-ranking of Pan American <clears throat> is that I believe, based on really extensive interviews with contacts that I have in Guatemala, that the Cascabel silver deposit in Guatemala uh, will be returned to production in 2024, that a political and social accord uh, in Guatemala itself, and in particular in northern Guatemala, where that deposit is, will be reached in a way that will allow Pan American to return Cascabel to production. Mm -hmm. If that happens, and I believe it will, I don't know it will, if that happens, uh, Pan American silver production doubles. Uh, and I don't think that Cascabel ranks in the market capitalization of Pan American at all. Uh, there's also icing on that cake there's a different 500 million ounce high grade deposit in pan american called navidad in argentina uh thus far uh pan american has worked more than a decade to develop the political and social accord in san juan province and in argentina to put navidad in production and thus far those efforts have been completely fruitless mm -hmm. should uh Pan American be able, as a consequence of hard work or, or Argentina's fiscal condition, to put Navidad and Cascabel in production, then their silver production triples with probably no increase in general administrative expense. That's a truly spectacular upside. Am I saying it's going to occur? No. But should it go into my calculations, my speculative calculations? Yes, absolutely. Hmm. If you go a little bit lower in market cap to something like, well, SSR mining, I believe you mentioned it earlier, or something like even Hecla Silver, sort of the two and a half billion dollar producers. How do you feel about that spot in the market? Because you you don't have the same upside as the much smaller ones, but you also don't have the same downside protections as the one you just discussed. How do you feel about that range? I think that Hecla and uh, Coeur d'Alene will be the biggest beneficiaries of inflows of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not attracted to either of them personally on a valuation basis at today's silver price. Hmm. Uh, 
I don't see uh, all, well, I don't see any uh, tier one high quality silver mines in either companies. I see a collection of assets, some of which are good, some of which are not good. And I see in particular a strategy uh, on Hecla's, uh, from Hecla's point of view, of buying smaller deposits, which could be placed into production quickly. I understand the rationale for doing that. I just have an inherent bias personally against a small operationally intensive deposits. That being said, the market will disagree with me. Uh, if we have a silver bull market, you will tease me two or three years from now for missing out on the two brand names, Coeur d'Alene and Hecla, from a speculative point of view and spending too much time on risk-adjusted net present value, which nobody other than myself seems to care about. Uh, but that's a mistake I'll make. I personally would rather be, you know, involved in the mags, the Fresnios, and the Silvercrests of the world, where there were deposits that were, from my own point of view, of higher quality, uh, higher uh, operating quality. Hmm. It's also worthy to note that we, in the case of almost all the silver producers, SSR, Pan American, Hecla, uh, Coeur d'Alene, uh, they're increasingly becoming gold mining companies in drag. Uh, an increasing amount of their revenues and cash flow are coming from the gold business. That doesn't matter in a bull market. Uh, SSR will somehow find a way to get silver back in its name. <laughs> you know, that's that's just the way these things work. But I suspect that the beneficiary uh, of the mania, if a mania occurs, will be the names that you mentioned. It'll be uh, the maybe not the SSRs, but certainly the Hecklas and the Coeur d'Alene's. But then at the same time, you can also just keep going. There's, there's always something that uh, that is, you know, in, in a lower market cap. And and two particular names that are attracting attention right now would be uh, Vizsla Silver and Hercules, which both of them had doubters and they've well, done like five, six hundred percent. I was a doubter around Hercules. Mm. Uh, the distal uh, high grade epithermal silver veins. uh <laughs> turned out to allow them to vector in on what is looking like an absolutely spectacular copper deposit. <laughs> I, I've seen that happen in the past. Uh, that one, uh, that's mind boggling. I mean, I saw pictures of the core uh, and that's some of the best looking, uh, what looks like super gene I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it's truly juicy rock. I wouldn't consider that a, a silver stock anymore. I would call that a porphyry discovery. And I would suggest that the value that will occur there uh, is going to come from, you know, calcopyrite and boronite copper minerals. Visla, uh, that's a legitimate discovery, uh, as is Aya, frankly. Uh, I mean, these are big, high-grade, juicy systems with lots of exploration upside left in them. Uh, Aya gets penalized a little bit because it's in Morocco. Uh, a jurisdiction some Americans can't spell. But there's a very high caliber person there, Benoit LaSalle, who built Semifo, uh in jurisdictions that many people would consider to be challenging, you know, Burkina Faso, Mali, places like that. A, a very high quality guy. And I, I think the quality of those deposits, the AYA deposits uh, and the Visla deposits, the discoveries, I think are substantial. And I think in any silver market, uh, those, if the stocks don't perform pretty immediately, they'll be taken over by other companies. Those are legitimate, um, high quality discoveries. Mm. It, 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 do you have the same opinion on, um, well, we're talking about places that maybe Americans can spell, but like the Balkans, there's some stuff moving there. There's an interesting discovery with Adriatic that's got some silver in it. I, I own a bunch of Adriatic, uh, personally. Uh, I Adriatic is being punished right now because it's in the, quote, boring part of the Lassonde curve. They're building the mine. Uh, and so the news has to do with on time, on budget completion, civil works, stuff that bores investors to tears. That discovery seems to me to have the long-term potential to be a tier one deposit. I'm not saying it's going to be a tier one deposit, but I think it has the potential to be that. 
Volcanogenic massive sulfide targets like that usually occur in clusters. And uh, this is, of course, you know, silver, copper, lead, zinc. Um, I'm very high on Adriatic. If they complete the build on time on budget, which they may or may not, uh, once they attain nameplate capacity, which is to say on time, on budget, <laughs> performed as scheduled, if that occurs, that stock re-rates without an increase in the silver price. Mm -hmm. We are kind of jumping around because uh, I was just reminded of a recent interview I did with uh, John from Abra Silver. Um, you know, I've talked about the company before, yep. so I know you know it. So feel free to tell me something new. Uh they did a much better job with that deposit than I thought they would. Uh, I I remember that we bought that deposit, Diablios, for Silver Standard. And if my memory serves me well, we paid $2.5 million for that deposit. But pretty clearly, we should have thrown some holes in it. <laughs> uh, after uh, the team that now runs Silver Standard took over from Bob Quartermain, uh, I sold my silver standard stock. One of the reasons I owned it was because uh, I had a very high opinion of Bob Quartermain and I had a very high opinion of Bob Quartermain's methodology. For uh, silver standard, the Abra deposit became a source of cash. They had their game plan involved buying underloved assets and investing capital in them. And they obtained the capital from selling off the portfolio of silver assets that Bob had acquired for pennies on the dollar, including the Diablios asset. Mm. Uh, the people around Abra did a much better job than Bob and I, uh, and a much better job than the SSR guys did of understanding the nature of the mineralization at Diablios mm. uh, and vectoring in uh, on what has become a very important silver deposit. Mm. I, Which I'm embarrassed to say I missed a hundred percent. Well, I'm there's a bunch of stuff that I, I sort of feel the same way. And then there's also a bunch of stuff that I look at their charts and I think like I'm really thankful that I somehow uh, uh avoided it. And even though a lot of people had high hopes for them, and one of those is also Gatto Silver or Gatos or whatever how however you want to pronounce it. They've not been able to I mean they're they're lower than their IPO price right now. Also, another company that you and I have discussed, um, uh, also in Mexico. Any opinion there? Yeah, um, that's another one I need to do some work on. Gatos is, of course, backed by um, Tom Kaplan, mm -hmm. longtime friend of mine, uh, somebody who made me a lot of money uh, in an old movie, so I'm fairly fond of. Uh, they had the same reconciliation failure. The silver crest did, except for much more dramatic. The stock has fallen off by a ton. And I would say that while the operating performance there has been good, it hasn't been as good as silver crest's operating performance. Yeah. Um, again, that's a deposit that I've been around a very long time. It was discovered by two prospectors who I've known for most of my adult life. <laughs> um, it, it is also a deposit that unfortunately Silver Standard passed on uh before uh tom picked it up so mark that as a second mistake by me hmm. um so. these are very high quality people these are very tenacious people uh, and as we begin to get uh more operating data from them and as they begin to increase the drill density uh in mine planning uh, and we get better data around the ore body, which is to say drilled on 10 meter rather than 40 or 50 meter centers. Uh, I'll be able to answer your question better. Mm. So, someone else who made you a lot of money, but has kind of been punished over the last five years is uh, Mr. McEwen. Uh, do you still yeah. have the same trust in him that you used to maybe in your younger years? Yeah, he's a very high quality guy. Uh, and I think he may or may not be able to redeem himself at McEwen Mining. But I think he will <laughs> redeem himself uh, in the copper business. That's mm. a very, very large copper deposit. Uh, decent grade, bad topography. Bad topography in the sense that it lies in a valley bottom. Uh, and, you know, the pushbacks uh, involve moving a lot of material on the sides. 
Right. But the size of the deposit and the grade and the tenor uh, are such that if the copper market does as well in the next five years as I think it will, <clears throat> that Rob will redeem himself. Rob is also uh, a dead honest human being, uh, which isn't common among promoters. Uh, Bob will tell you that he is intending to do something, which is true. Um, sometimes, uh, as a consequence of his making a mistake or commodity prices not going the way that he thinks they'll go, <laughs> he ends up being wrong. Mm. Uh, mm. I wasn't attracted to the McEwen assets because it seemed to me that he had cobbled up a bunch of second tier Nevada assets. Uh, and I don't like second tier assets. You know, his first time through was with Red Lake, which is one of the best gold addresses on the planet. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was pretty clear that he was the right steward of those gold assets. He told the story extremely well. Uh, the McEwen challenge, where he made all of his data freeware, publicware, and actually staged a competition where uh, technologists from around the world could use the data and develop exploration targets for him was a stroke of genius in two ways. Uh, he got all kinds of free information uh, about his existing mine at the same time that he popularized the Gold Corp story around the world. I mean, it was absolutely a stroke of genius. A and he had probably the lowest cost of capital uh, cost of capital defined by me as market capitalization relative to net present value of any gold mining company in the world. Mm. And he also had the very good sense and and the lack of ego to understand that contributing that asset into a three-way amalgamation to form a, a larger gold company that would appear on all the equity indexes and get all the free index buying would lower the cost of capital further. Uh, he had no need, no ego need to be the CEO to run that business. He was a large shareholder and he wanted to see other shareholders do well. So yes, I'm very fond of Mr. McEwen for those reasons. If if three years ago, someone had told me that uh, McEwen Mining and GoGold would have about the same weighting in the SIL um, ETF and also have about the same market cap, I would have said, impossible on both because McEwen has fallen 60 percent go gold's up like 500 percent yep a well, any opinion at, on that that development yeah, sure look at the drill holes hmm. uh, i mean go gold is a strong tier two district may end up being a tier one district hmm. uh the go gold guys are good promoters make no mistake they're not rob McEwen, but they have more to work with uh, their results have been spectacular, and they've been spectacular, too, in a way that most speculators don't realize. Their drilling has become predictive. They understand the genesis of those deposits uh, and the relationship of those deposits in a way that now when they develop uh, an exploration thesis for an extension, uh, they describe the thesis and they test it with the drill bit about 80% of the time, their thesis turns out to be correct. They know enough about the deposit that their exploration is becoming predictive. And that's often uh, a, a point when there's sort of the maximum leverage available. I remember in the middle part of the decade of the 80s, when Barrick began to understand how the roots of the deep Carlin systems were working. Uh, and they added ounces unbelievably quickly once they came to understand how these plumbing systems worked in these big deposits. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, that Go Gold is onto a new Carlin. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm only suggesting that uh, with Go Gold, they have a gold district that is an excellent district, but in addition, they have an excellent understanding of that district. Mm. And that's why you've seen the stock do so well. It's true. C Carlin type deposits are always interesting to me because they're they're usually very hard to find and understand. But once you find them and understand them, they are they bring 
you know, good gifts. And that's also a, a curse too, because at the same time, you know, promoters would um, sort of tease a potential Carlin type discovery and they would spend six years and, you know, $60 million of my money looking for it and never finding it. Uh, so that's kind of challenging for me. But um, no, good point on that. It seems like we've sort of stayed above about $200 million in market cap. Um. Is there a reason to go below that, given how hated these things are and, and in terms of risk reward? Uh, it depends on drill holes. Mm. Uh, listen, there's nothing in the world I like more than a really, truly hated five or ten million dollar stock yeah. <laughs> where uh, the probability is that I'll lose half my money and the possibility exists that I'll get a 20 bagger. Uh, I absolutely love those things. I mm. keep looking for another Visla. Um, I'm I continue to tease myself as an example with Reina, where I have a position. Uh, I have a lot of time for Peter Maga. Uh, I think Peter Maga is a brilliant geologist who uh, is spreading his talents among ten companies. So I never understand on an individual day whether he's working for me or not. Uh, but I certainly believe in a certain style of mineralization, uh, carbonate replacement mineralization, that he's, you know, at least one of the world's ranking experts. And so I'm, and by the way, I wouldn't suggest to your listening audience that they pay attention to uh, speculative selections that require as much geological knowledge <laughs> uh, as I'm willing to spend on a 10 or 20 or $30 million stock. But since you asked me the question, I'll answer it. You know, sure. Where, where do you rank Raina Silver? I have Raina as a five. Yeah. Uh, I like, which by the way is pretty high uh, relative to the information I have available to me. I love their exploration targets. I think the probability is that I lose money on them, uh, but I think the upside associated with at least two of their targets is so high that I can't help myself. Mm. Uh, I think it's like 65 or 70 percent cheaper since the last time we talked about it. So yep. it's uh, taken a beating. I interviewed them as well. Um, there's sort of a combination because there's Raina Silver and then there's Raina Gold. The CEO also runs the two companies. Also an interesting combination there. Um, we're we're, we're <laughs> It's again, a, probably not something you do in terms of rankings, but is there, like, would you rank an ETF or physical silver higher than the companies if you had to put a rankings on, on those different type of asset classes? No, not for me. Mm. Uh, because of the extraordinary market response that you get with the equities. Yeah. Uh, Physical silver for me is almost an orphan. Most of my physical precious metals ownership is in gold with a lower amount in platinum. Um, I don't consider silver to be an insurance asset the way I consider gold to be an insurance asset. Uh, I own gold for fear purposes, not for greed purposes. I own silver for greed purposes. But the silver stocks uh, have such incredible leverage that I overweight the silver stocks relative to physical silver in my own portfolio. In my own portfolio, I'm absolutely sanguine about losing 50 or 60% of my money mm. when I see a potential 10-fold or 15-fold or 20-fold you know, 20 gain. And in the silver, uh, I've, just, I've watched the silver equities go absolutely bananas three different times in my career. Uh, and at age 70, I'd like to see it happen one more time. <laughs> it's also interesting to me, though, that um, something that you said before, that the total market cap of the silver companies, that's what Doug Casey said, was not large enough to uh, accommodate the inflows of capital that would happen. And it it, it almost sounds to me like it's going to be hard to bring new real silver companies on the market because, sure, you can slap silver on the name, but there's just yeah. not that many silver deposits that you can go public with, right? No, absolutely true. I mean, the truth is that the the market will manufacture a hundred of them. 
uh, and probably 90 will be overt frauds. Hmm. That's the nature of the market. There are all kinds of scrappy little silver veins uh, in Peru, uh, in Mexico, in Idaho, Utah, Nevada, British Columbia. And if you saw silver go through $50, uh, every single one of them would probably be used as an excuse for some goofball shell. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, you know, that's that's the way those things work. How do I how do I see that beforehand? Like how do, how do I not lose money on it? That's what I'm asking. Well, I uh, what I would do probably if I had any substantial amount of money in the the mineral exploration stocks is I would probably subscribe to a service like Brent Cook and Joe Mazumdar's Exploration Insights. The alternative to that, uh, this sounds rather self-serving, uh, but watch every ep episode of The Rural Classroom. Uh, learn how to analyze uh, silver stocks for yourself and subject the management teams to the interview that I have described in uh, interrogating mining companies. If you're willing to do the work, which most people aren't, it's pretty easy to avoid the frauds. Uh, what isn't easy to avoid are the failed honest efforts where you have a good target, a well thought out thesis, good people prosecuting it, good money. And the thesis turns out to be wrong, <laughs> a well thought out mistake. <clears throat> you can't, you can't avoid that, but it's pretty easy to avoid the frauds. Very good point that you cannot avoid that. I mean, these things happen and you have to, uh, you can avoid a game over loss though, by weighing your portfolio properly towards <clears throat> that. That's what you taught me at least. Well, so, beyond uh, that, by uh, admitting defeat, hmm. uh, you know, uh, when <clears throat> you have a thesis and you're answering a series of unanswered questions, when you come to a no answer, the absence of a yes answer, when the reason to own a stock is gone, the stock has to be gone irrespective of price. Uh, losing 30% isn't pleasant, but it's more pleasant than losing 70. You have to be honest with yourself. Uh, you'll recall earlier in this interview that you said that your exit is something that you should think about before your entry. Uh, in a speculative stock, my exit always involves uh, a, a process uh, of answering a series of unanswered questions. And if the answer to the question becomes no, uh, which is to say that the thesis has been disproved, I have no reason to own the stock anymore. Uh, if the stock has fallen from a dollar to 50 cents, c'est la vie. You know, uh, it's gone. C'est la vie and hasta la vista at the same time. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, you, you Europeans are really uh, wonderful with language. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We have no choice because um, yeah, European dictatorship over the last couple of um, 100 years has, has completely made it interesting for us not to put it negatively. But it's uh, it's rollinvestmentmedia.com for people wondering all these rankings that you were talking about. People can put in their um natural resource portfolio and rick will get back to you um you can also have a question account how many how many companies do you cover in 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 the rankings i think we're at about 800 800 how many of those yeah. silver like 20 i don't know to be honest maybe well that, that that could be a that good ratio right that you know when right. yeah yeah well that, that could be a good ratio when, when it goes you know when, when silver companies take up 20 percent of the rankings you just exit all of them that's an easy strategy yeah, I, I'm not really good at those rules of thumb, frankly. Um, I, I realize they're convenient, but I found that they very seldom work for me. The only rule of thumb that works for me is when everybody hates something, I'm supposed to like it mm. uh, and vice versa. No, that's not true. The The other rule of thumb that works for me, and this really has worked for me, <clears throat> if there's a commodity that's necessary uh, for the maintenance of the material standard li of living of humankind, and that commodity is selling for less than production cost, either the price of that commodity is going to go up or it's going to become unavailable. <laughs> I, 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 need to, I need to refresh my memory around that uh, again and again and again. 
when uranium was selling for $30, it cost $60 to make. There were two choices. The price of uranium could go up or the lights would go out. Those were the only two choices. Pretty clear what was going to happen. When the oil price was 20 bucks a barrel, it cost $60 a barrel to make the stuff. Either the price of oil was going to go up or cars wouldn't start. Really simple stuff. Yeah. Uh, sadly, the only material on a global basis that I know of that's flirting with that right now is platinum. Hmm. And it's only flirting with it. It's not way, way, way below production cost, although we don't have a very good sense of what Russian production costs are. Well, maybe that's but a topic for... That maybe is a rule a of thumb. I mean, that is a rule of thumb that's really worked for me. If you have a material that's broadly consumed, that's necessary for the material living standards of humankind, and it's priced well below the cost of production, it becomes a no-brainer. Mm. Uh, it, it becomes... a uh, a when question rather than an if question. They don't come that often. No, no, sir. That's right. That's right. And all the more reason that when it happens, like Buffett says, you know, if if a if, if a really wonderfully disproportionate bet is shown you, you go all in. Mm. You really, really, really go. Platinum is a, a a a podcast in and of itself. I think that we can talk about. It's absolutely not discussed uh, broadly out there. So that's um, something that I can look forward to. Do you have anything else coming up? Any boot camps? Uh, you just went through conference. So anything else coming up? We have a wonderful boot camp coming up in January. A, a developers boot camp. Uh, we talked about the boring part of the Lassonde curve. Mm. Uh, companies that have either pre feasibility studies or feasibility studies. Companies that may be in construction. Uh, or finance to construction. This is the part where the news cycle becomes tedious, but where the value creation uh, occurs with the highest probability. Lots can go wrong. You know, you can be over time, you can be uh, above budget, you can bring in a deposit that doesn't measure up, which is to say doesn't attain nameplate capacity, as we discussed with Gatos or Silvercrest. But the probabilities are higher among the development stage companies than uh, any other part of the junior stack. Um, I love probabilities. I love the idea that I can buy a company like G Mining or a company like Adriatic, where I have a wonderful sense of the deposit, where other competitors, other speculators aren't in the market because they're in the boring part of the cycle. And where if I get nameplate capacity on time, on budget, or approaching it, I get a complete re-rate in the stock. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to have uh, 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 at, at least one keynote speaker that's been identified so far, Doug Silver, who is going to talk about the capital stack uh, around mine development. Uh, some people will know him as one of the inventors of the mineral royalty business who <clears throat> went on from there to co-found Orion. And given that he generated about $10 billion in development capital, I can't think of a better person to talk to, to, to talk about the capital stack <laughs> than him. As with all my other boot camps, by the way, <clears throat> anyone who attends and pays the tuition, which is 99 US dollars, who doesn't believe that they got their money's worth, can email me and I'll give them their money back. So the financial risk is all mine, 100% gold-plated money-back guarantee. This has been very, very, very good. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen a, a, an interview that long of yours, and I'm very thankful uh, and grateful to um, Kylie. I want to give her a shout-out because she makes these things happen, and I, 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 uh, yes. I'm i sure you're, you're grateful for her, but uh, I'm sure you're not grateful enough because she does a very good job. She always gets back to my emails quickly. So, And thank you as well, Rick, for, doing, for making this happen. Thank you. And thanks for recognizing Callie. She she can find me when I can't find me. So she's a she's a wonderful human. <laughs>